So my name is Lena Hartikalis, and I'm the director of Penn's DSW program. Really happy to see some DSW folks in the crowd, current students, alumni, faculty, and others who are very, very welcome to be with us today. So this is the first in a speaker series that we designed to commemorate and celebrate our 10th year as the first social work practice doctorate in the country. I don't get a hand. <laughs> so we really couldn't think of any better way of celebrating our 10th anniversary than to invite some of our many accomplished um, DSW alumni to come and speak with folks about the terrific and important work they're doing in all sorts of areas of practice. So we're starting today with two of our alums who have been devoting their, uh, every, every, I think, they, would, they might agree with this, every <laughs> part of themselves yeah. to the problem of mass incarceration. Um, we have Allison Neff and we have Kirk James. I'm going to introduce each of them individually. I think, um, Dr. James, you're going to go first. Um, and they will speak with you for about 45 minutes or so to tell you about their perspectives on this problem of mass incarceration and how they have been trying to make a dent in, in um, uh, working against mass incarceration. And, um, and then we'll open it up at the end for questions. If you have clarifying questions you want to ask along the way, I'm sure they'll both be willing to entertain those. Um, so I believe that Dr. James is, Kirk is going to set things up with more of an historical and academic sort of context-driven um, uh, conversation with you all or presentation to you all on the problem of mass incarceration. And then Allison, Dr. Neff, is going to follow that by um, talking about some more applied sort of clinical um, practice interventions that are going on here at the school. So let me give you their introductions here, which I don't have memorized, although I know them pretty darn well. I don't want to leave anything out from their important detail here. Um, but Dr. Neff is the clinical director of SB2, Center for Carceral Communities. And under the direction of Dr. T.J. Ghos, who is here, um, she coordinates psychosocial care for people released from incarceration. She's a 2017 DSW program graduate. And her dissertation project was reconstructing the center, the institutional logics of a structural intervention for a post-incarceration community. So her work focuses on organizational processes that empower marginalized communities receiving care and social service agencies. Um, Dr. Neff also does trainings for organizations that work with marginalized people, including incarcerated folks, to help to um, prepare them to work properly and, and substantively with those people. She's a lecturer also in our MSW program, teaching a number of courses, several courses for us. So Allison will speak after Dr. Kirk James, who is the clinical professor at the NYU Silver School of Social Work in New York. Um, while he was a DSW student, he graduated in 2013, but while he was a DSW student, um, Dr. James also served as another, uh, on another of our initiatives in a center that we have here that is focused on the issue of mass incarceration and decarceration. And that is SB2's Goldring Reentry Initiative, GRI. That's a program that helps prepare our <coughs> MSW students to work with folks who encounter barriers to reentry as they're leaving the prison system. Um, as I said, Dr. James completed his DSW in 2013, and his dissertation was, is, The Invisible Epidemic in Social Work Academia. He examined the complex problem of mass incarceration through a historical and contemporary lens, and from that, he developed a curriculum for MSW students to try to prepare them to work with folks who are coming out of the criminal justice system or in the criminal justice system. Um, the courses that he developed from his dissertation 
have been implemented at Columbia University, Temple University, City College of New York, and Penn, amongst others. And his primary research and publications focus on deconstructing issues of mass incarceration, especially as it pertains to trauma, cognitive development, culpability, and an ex examination of systems that foster and perpetuate racial injustice. You can see why I didn't want to try to memorize <laughs> all of that. So I'm, again, delighted to welcome Dr. James and Dr. Neff, uh, Kirk and Allison, to tell you all they have to tell you. Thank you. Thanks. And you can pop over here while you're talking. Sure. You. Get my head out of the PowerPoint. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, thank you, Lena. Uh, how are people doing today? So I'm, I'm going to stand and talk if you don't mind, as um, I've been sitting for a while and I just want my energy to be up. So how many people, I usually, uh, when I first started doing this work, maybe 10, 11 years ago, I asked people to around. raise their hand to if they knew someone that was incarcerated. And I'm going to ask that. Raise your hand if you know someone that has been incarcerated. Right? Uh, just look around. Keep your hands up and just like look around, right? Okay. Um, Think about that for a second, right? Almost two-thirds of this room know someone that has been personally incarcerated. And just sit with that as we go through this presentation. I'm going to ask a few questions, too, because oftentimes what happens in these conversations is that we're speaking to the choir. Do you know what I mean by that? It's like, and so how many people have seen 13? Okay. How many people have read The New Jim Crow? Okay. Have people seen the Rikers documentary? Okay, cool. So I mean, pretty much a choir almost, right? So for the folks that are not the choir, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to really ground this conversation before Allison takes over. So the umbrella in which I do my work under is called Evolve, right? And if you look at it, it's, it's almost a play on words, right? What do you see in Evolve? Love, right? So how do we evolve? We evolve through love, right? Just hold that for a second, because I, I don't feel that this work changes via policy. I really don't, right? I, I mean, um, someone said to me once, it's like, look at the history of this country and, and tell me like, what significant change has ever come about as a result of policy. So really ground that for a second. Um, mass incarceration and trauma, those are really how I would like to ground this conversation. I would also like to, especially for folks that are clinicians, right, to really begin to think about then, what does our practice look like working with folks that have been impacted. So I just saw Phyllis Solomon um, on my way in, right? And as my research professor, she always like grounded in us, like, you know, define your variables, define your variables, right? So what is mass incarceration? It's an open question. Anyone? I thought the cameraman was going. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone, what is mass incarceration? When the jail is overcrowded with a lot of people. Anyone else want to take a crack at this? Yes. Problems. Yeah, absolutely, right? So I, here's my definition of mass incarceration, right? Mass incarceration is the euphemism for neo-slavery. I feel in academic spaces, we often use jargon that makes like really messed up things sound really nice, right? Um, and oftentimes I say to my classes, right, I've never heard us talk about such like oppressive, dehumanizing things with such niceties, right? So I really don't want to like lull you to sleep, right? I want to be very direct in that mass incarceration is a euphemism for neo-slavery. If you feel challenged by that, I'm going to ask you to just like really sit with that for a second and allow me to kind of like go through why I believe this is so. So. Much of this conversation starts with the 13th Amendment, right? Um, everyone in this room will probably admit or say that slavery was a bad thing, right? But very few people have that same type of connection to issues of mass incarceration. The 13th Amendment is often hailed as the amendment that freed the slaves, right? Like everyone was like, oh my God, we have the 13th Amendment, it's really great, you know, we're taught this in school, it freed the slaves. Yet there was this little thing in there that no one ever stopped to really talk about, right? And the clause in there was neither slave, slavery nor involuntary servitude except as punishment for a crime, right? So it, it kind of told you that within this amendment that slavery could kind of continue for people that were arrested and convicted of crimes. 
Now, I want you to pause and think about this for a second, right? When people were being released from slavery, or there was no um, 401k, there were no pension plans, there were no savings account. You know, so really, like, think about what that experience must have been for people. Imagine how, on one hand, it's, you know, it must be thrilling to feel like, oh, my God, I won't be in bondage, physical bondage anymore. But what exactly am I going to do? What exactly can I do? So this period, in many ways, Reconstruction, was, was thought as, as a really important time in the history of America, right? Because it wasn't only a time to, to really reckon with the history of slavery, but it was an opportunity for us to really like, create a country that allowed for an oppressed population to have an opportunity within the society. Instead, what happened was we got black codes. So black codes were literally laws that essentially criminalized every facet of black life, right? So looking a white person in the eye was a crime. Walking on the same side of the street as a white person was a crime. Not being able to take care of your children was a crime. Stealing food was a crime. They had laws that were so punitive, right? They had pig laws which meant that, uh, because people, again, think about, ground this in the fact that you are leaving an institution of slavery and oppression, and you have no way to take care of your family. If people stole, often called pig laws, the punishment was as much as five years in prison, right? You could not defend yourself in a court of law, oftentimes, right? So you essentially had laws that criminalize every facet of black life, right? Every facet of black life post-slavery has been criminalized. This is just an example of the black codes. So think how systematic this is too. This is a very linear system, right? It's a very linear system of oppression. So immediately after black codes, you have what's called convict leasing system. So convict leasing system essentially becomes a mechanism that once a person of color is, or a black person is convicted, they are now leased out to the same plantations in which they were enslaved, or others, or any other institution looking for cheap labor, right? And in the conceptualization of a convict, you were further dehumanized, right? Because now you were a convict, and, and the language and the connotation that goes with being a convict, right? And in many ways, this system, um, there's a really good book, Mancini, um, One Die Gets Another, One Die Get Another, right? And it really speaks to just how disposable black bodies were, and maybe in, 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 in still are, right, in this country, right? So one dies, get another, right? And because again, when you add the, the conceptualization of convict to this conversation, the level of dehumanization took even a lower level, right? And this is a picture in a convict camp. So also within the same period, right, you had something that still lingers to this day, right? This conceptualization of crime and color. You were now, in, in many ways, slavery existed. There's always an ideology that substantiates some level of oppression, right? We don't just carry out oppression as much as there's an idea that's put forward to substantiate it. So slavery was in many ways substantiated because blacks were considered to be inferior. Right, like it was easy to say, well, they're not really human, right? I mean, we had 1776 in Philadelphia, the Declaration of Independence, which said, you know, like all human beings are created equal and blah, 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 right? But that obviously did not apply to blacks. And as a result, we continue to have this level of systematic oppression, um, more so to the point where crime and color almost became synonymous, right? And one of the quote-unquote researchers who was, whose work was really utilized during this period was Hoffman's 1896 Race, Trace, and the Tendencies of the American Negro. So here was someone in 1896 who, irrespective of black codes, irrespective of convict leasing system, felt empowered to say that blacks are inherently criminal, right? And so you start to see this linkage of crime and color something that we see still very prominently today. 
I believe it was yesterday um, I saw in the news um, a young man that was shot in his backyard in Oakland, California, right, with his cell phone. Why? Because the cops felt afraid. Why did they feel afraid? Because we have been conditioned to see people of color as threatening, as criminals, as dangerous. So if you fast forward 100 years later, right, and this, again, is a really significant period in America, right? We, we have the civil rights era, right? We have another period, again, where we're supposed to reckon with the history of this country. We're supposed to reckon with the level of injustice that has historically taken place. And what we essentially have is new black codes. You know, we have the Rockefeller drug laws, essentially a war on colored people. We have mandatory minimums. We have truth in sentencing, three strikes, stop and frisk, and essentially a war on immigrants. All this is incentivized by $8 billion annually by the federal government, right? And also, you then have a, a very like, poignant like, neoconservative agenda, right? And this is, especially, this is especially relevant for folks that are doing clinical practice, right? So you have a neoconservative agenda, which essentially says that crime and behavior, that kind of like reduces behavior, I mean, criminal, quote unquote, behavior to individuals, right? And totally negates social determinants. So in social work, one of the things that we love to say is, and, and I think it's very relevant, see the person in their environment, right? See the person in their context. And yet we have kind of an ideology that's put forward that negates that, right? Um, and you have Reagan who says, here in the richest nation in the world, where more crime is committed than any other nation, we are told that the answer is to reduce poverty. So, and, and Reagan essentially denounces that, right? Denounces poverty as you know, a cause for crime. Bush, we must raise our voices to correct an insidious tendency, the tendency to blame crime in society rather than a criminal, right? So you have, again, these two presidents who I believe were president between um, 1981 and 1994, right? And um, during the period that they were president, you had, you <coughs> went from essentially a prison population at the end of the 70s that was approximately 200,000 to a prison population over 2 million, right? During the time specifically that these men were president, right? So today, you know, and Peter Griffin, uh, <laughs> we have 25% of the world's prison population and only 5% of the world's population, right? And, and this is like really only the tip of the iceberg because we oftentimes only, we talk about the people that are actually in prison. What we don't talk about is the people that are essentially in prison in their communities, right? So the numbers may vary, but in some research, from between seven and 10 million Americans are under some form of community supervision. So if you look at this chart, right, we will see the rates of incarceration for the rest of the world versus the United States. So the United States rate of incarceration is 670 per 100,000. And you can see the rest of the world is struggling to keep up with the greatest democracy on earth. Women are now the fastest growing prison population. And you can see the numbers has continually risen throughout the years. And you should really think about this for a second, too, because families have already been compromised by mass incarceration, right? More, we know that, like, men, men are not present, right? Black men especially are not present in their communities. They're in prison, right? And women for many years, many centuries, right, have been the ones that have essentially held family systems together. So now when you see the prevalence of incarceration towards women, you have family systems that are already compromised being further destroyed. We also, we're, we don't discriminate, right? We incarcerate more young people than any other nation in the world. Again, you can see these rates, right? And I think something that's really interesting in, in this statistic, right, as someone who's been through the DSW program, I've often thought about you know, like we talk a lot about utilization of empirical data, right? Um, brain development. Brain development does optimally occur till like 24, 25, right? Um, and yet we still have a system that has no empirical validity to maybe say 18 is, 
you know, like a, a age we can incarcerate someone as an adult or even 13 based on the type of crime that the person commits, right? You're seeing Philadelphia now react to, you know, uh, its juvenile life population, right? Um, folks who have been incarcerated, some of them for 30 years, who have went to prison 14, 15, 16 years old, based on what rationale? What empirical data do we have to substantiate that a 13-year-old has the same level of cognition as a developed adult? We have no empirical data whatsoever, but yet we continue to utilize these very uh, draconian practices. I'm going to skip that. So again, mass incarceration is neo-slavery, but the concept of mass incarceration is also a fallacy, right? Mass incarceration would mean that we would all have the same opportunity for incarceration, which is not true. So lifetime likelihood of imprisonment of US residents born in 2001, all men, one in nine, so men in general have a larger likelihood of incarceration. Um, white men, one in 17. Um, black men, one in three. How many people in here identify as black men? So chances are one in three of us has been a prison. And in Philadelphia, in certain communities, you know, those numbers are even greater, right? So Latino men, one in six. All women, one in 56. White women, one in 111. Black men, black women, I'm sorry, one in 18. And Latino women, one in 45. So again, you can see that, you know, the population with the greatest likelihood of going to prison are black men. So this begs the question, you know, are we a democratic nation or are we the world's largest prison? So my, my work is deeply personal as well, right? So 94A6325 um, is a number that's really symbolic for me. But I came of age in the 1990s, right? And as folks that came of age in the 1990s, a lot of music was speaking about this phenomenon in a way that academics are <laughs> just starting to get and understand, right? So one of my favorite songs was um, Wu-Tang Clan, right, uh, Cream. And there's, there's this one particular lyric that I want you to think about. And it's like 40 of us in the back of a bus, right, prison bus. Life as a shorty shouldn't be so rough. But as the world turn, I learn life is hell, living in a world no different from a cell. You know, and, and, these, and, and if you listen to these songs, for people that can deconstruct these songs, right, you're hearing, you're hearing about prisons, you're hearing about like trauma, you're hearing about utilizing substances to deal with depression and trauma. You're hearing about the impact of capitalism, not being able to, you know, like, uh, not being able to assess the economy, right? So you're hearing all these things that we are just starting. We talk about intersectionality. You know, these folks who have been impacted by these issues have been speaking about these issues forever but we haven't given them any validity. And a lot of that is because we've been told to really disregard black men. You know, like black men are inherently criminal. So like why even listen to anything that they're saying? But if you go back and you listen to this music that w maybe at one point you thought was just nonsense, you can hear a cry for help. You can hear the issues that are being faced in a community. So for me, 94A6325 is my DIN number, right? Meaning that in 1994, I was arrested. We talked about one in three black men, you know, are arrested. Well, I was arrested, right? I was arrested in 1994. And in 1994, I was 18 years old. I was a first time college student. And one of the things when I got arrested, I thought was gonna happen was I really believed in the system of justice. You know, I'd grown up wanting to be an attorney. I'd grown up, you know, I was in college studying what was considered at that time juvenile delinquency, right? So I wanted to be an attorney. I wanted to work in a system that afforded people an opportunity to you know, correct their lives and to be better. And I believed in this concept of justice. And I remember getting arrested, right? And my first offer was 40 years to life, right? And I remember saying to the attorney who, from the other side of the cell who was telling me this, I said, are you sure you're looking at the right charges, right? I said, I'm not here for murder. I did not kill anyone. And he said to me, he said, possessing 
or selling up to four ounces of cocaine in New York City is the equivalent of murder. Think about this for a second, right? This is the impact of the Rockefeller drug laws. Possessing two to four ounces of cocaine is equivalent to murder, right? A1 felony, if you were convicted of murder, you would be convicted of an A1 felony, right? So I was being charged with drug possession with, and, and it wasn't even directly, it was alleged with eight A1 felonies. So essentially, I murdered eight people for possessing two to four ounces of cocaine. That was the equivalent. Think about that for a second, right? I, I don't want you to <laughs> raise your hand if you know what two to four ounces of cocaine is, but two to four ounces of cocaine is a really minute, two to four ounces of anything is a very minute amount of anything, right? So how does that make sense? How does that make sense? It doesn't make sense, right? And yet many people have been impacted by these systems. So when I went to prison and I told the judge that I didn't do it, you know, I was set up. They told me, sure, obviously, you and everybody else, right? And as a result, I was sentenced to seven years to life. I went to three parole boards, each parole board for folks that saw Shawshank Redemption. I said the same thing at every parole board said the same thing, I told them what exactly went down, and they denied me. They told me that I wasn't being responsible for my actions, right? So three parole boards I got denied before I was finally released in 2003. Um, actually, March 25th, two March 25th will be 15 years since I've been released, right? And so, so much of my work since I've been released is to raise awareness to these issues as I feel like even the title of my dissertation was The Invisible Epidemic in Social Work Academia, right? That this issue is an issue that intersects with every facet of social work practice. There's no facet of social work practice. Whether you will work around issues of homelessness, there's a bi-directional relationship between homelessness and incarceration. If you're homeless, your likelihood of incarceration is greater. If you're incarcerated, your likelihood of homelessness is also significantly greater, right? Substance abuse, um, a really good friend said something to me once and I want to kind of like ground this conversation in it as well. He'd been arrested over 50 something times for drug usage, right? And he said, to, and it had been to treatment probably equally amount of times. And he said to me, this is not about the drug, right? It's not about the drugs. It's about the trauma in which I'm trying to escape. And we're gonna talk a little bit about trauma as we go on, but just really ground that conversation, right? If you work with families, right, school to prison pipeline, you know, very disruptive. You're seeing women being the fastest um, growing prison population, right? So there's no facet of social work practice in which this isn't impacted. Yet the research indicates that less than 5% of schools of social work actually have curriculum to ground students in these issues. So then what's our ability to really practice? What's our ability to really see the humanity and the totality of the people that we are working with? So, trauma, a physical or psychological experience that overwhelms an individual's ability to manage or cope. So our understanding of trauma comes from war, right? We saw when people came back from World War I, World War II, with brief exposures to violence, we realized that they were not the same. You know, our uncles, our brothers, um, our loved ones, they were not the same people who went away to war. The research, the VA in, uh, put a lot of money into doing research to try to understand what happened. So the initial diagnosis was shell shock syndrome, which it eventually morphed to PTSD, right? So we understood that when people have brief exposures to violence, right, it can have a significant impact. So I'm gonna play, this is, I'm gonna play a video really quickly. I, I won't play all of it, but I just want you to think about what's happening here and the stories that they're sharing. Something profound is this. Mm -hmm. So now dealing with these different traumas and it's just built and it's just built and we don't know about therapy, we don't know how to go get counseling and that doesn't exist in my neighborhood. We're not fortunate enough to have those type of facilities around the neighborhood. But we do have liquor stores on every four corners of this neighborhood because this therapy is needed in these communities and I see it and I just want to be a part of 
connecting the struggles and helping our young men, mm -hmm. sisters, to help get some healing. We don't look at that though inside our community. Mm -hmm. We just say, oh, that's Joe, he's crazy. Oh, he's an ammo, he's a bugger. Oh, watch out, you know, he might pop him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we don't got time to pay for expensive therapy and go downtown to treat it. That's some shit you just gotta swallow, hold that down, and deal with it. Me and my little brother, uh, Creamy, was known for wilding out, taking extremes, and having these emotional outbreaks in the community. Um, that led to incarceration. A prison is an abnormal environment, and it's a breeding ground for trauma. The first time you saw somebody get dealt with while you were in there, jumped, stabbed, or, or whatever it was, you know, there was that initial blow, that shock, you know. And then after a while, you know, it no longer became shock. It became like, hey, just don't get any blood on me. And you became used to it, right? Um, then it went from that to you becoming a participant in these violent acts. I didn't, all the people around me, I didn't screw that. It's like, I'm just in this moment, you know? And it's like, wow, okay. This is the moment, this is the moment that I've been waiting for. This is the cry I've been having in the penitentiary seven times. But I understand when I look back, I was in prison long before I got to prison. Because in the projects, I recall when they put the gates up all the way up. I remember the urine smell in the hallways and bodies in the hallways. I remember that as a child being affected by that. I remember seeing my community in the 70s in the projects where African marriage stole. <coughs> I remember coming out and seeing a father going to the factory happy to take care of his family. Then I remember the 80s and cocaine hit and it destroyed. It was systematic. I remember being in jail, being gang infested, right? I remember seeing my buddy stab and you had to keep walking. I remember that. I remember you had to carry a knife and you, you better not lose that knife. And, I, and they normalized no, And I got caught up in that cycle. I got caught up in that cycle, but my internal side was the alarm was like something wrong. It kept going off, something wrong. My seventh time in jail, I stopped running from me and I started studying me and I started putting stuff in me and I created a 10 year plan of visiting myself outside the world. And I sat there and I kept studying me and I kept studying me because I knew it was something inside of me. I just had to cultivate it. And I started attracting people like me who kept cultivating it. And then in June, my last time, I'm telling y'all, this is my brother right here, and I know it's part of you. I want to tell you what you got to say, brother, because I think you need to say it right now to free yourself even more. Get that out there. On May the 22nd, 2010, when I was in jail, finally 30 days being released, my daughter was murdered. She was stabbed in the neck at the age of 25. Mm -hmm. That was my test. I want to talk about resiliency. I had a 10 year plan. I did what fathers do, I cried, I kicked. But I freed myself when I went to her funeral and my ex-wife did the bench rally. I wasn't a bad guy. Because I remember the memories when she was little, I used to sit on my lap and read and talk to her. I used to give her a hug. I, she brought all that back. And I knew I had to now go out and face the world because I vowed her life would not be in vain. So the video that I just showed, right, it's it's kind of a glimpse into the experiences of men who have been through the correctional system, who have been through prisons. I think, again, you know, young black men, men between 18, 17, and 24, have the highest likelihood of violence, have the highest likelihood of abuse. Yet they're never thought of as that, right? They're never thought of as a vulnerable population. And they themselves have normalized so much of their own harm, right? I think that we tend to think about trauma, we tend to think about it, oh, maybe prison was traumatic, right? Poverty is traumatic. Systematic oppression is traumatic. Going to poor schools is traumatic. Over-policing in communities is traumatic. Right, not knowing where your next meal is going to come from is traumatic. Seeing people murdered, seeing people going to prison is traumatic. And in these stories, right, you hear men speak vulnerably about what their experiences have been, not only during prison, but before prison and after prison, right? And, and it's war. 
right? So again, it's war. They've lived and existed in war their entire lives, right? These are traumatic experiences. Um, trauma impacts our brain, right? Trauma impacts our ability to think. Freud, uh, one of the things I learned here, which has always sat with me, is he said that disease of the mind, one day I hope people realize disease of the mind is just as real as disease of the body, right? And I think that this is, this is that. We're at that period, right? We're at that period where we have to start to understand the impact of trauma in our society, right? So trauma literally, uh, there's a bridge that connects the left and right brain called the corpus callus, and trauma literally severs that bridge, right? Trauma literally has the ability to sever <coughs> that. So our ability to utilize both hemispheres of <coughs> our brain is actually impeded. Our ability to think critically is often impeded. When we, when we oftentimes think about ourselves, right, when we're in great degrees of stress and trauma, we oftentimes go back and look at the decisions we made and said, wow, what was I thinking, right? You weren't thinking. You weren't thinking, right? So imagine people who have lived and existed in these spaces their entire lives. Something else, too, it's never been post, right? It's never been post. I think I, a lot of people I start that are starting to catch on to this work talk about PTSD. What about it has been post? Like there's nothing about this system that has been post, right? And <coughs> the thing about mass incarceration is that people rarely escape these systems. People rarely escape these systems, right? Um, the prevalence of mental illness in our jails are significant, right? And, and I think these are like the tip of the iceberg, right? Because I feel like there's so many folks that are really just not diagnosed. And again, when we think about like rec recidivism, um, my, col my colleague Allison is going to speak a little bit more of that. I'm going to show a video, right? Because I want to just really ground us in this conversation of like what happens when people are released from prison, right? Um, because we talk a lot about it and we see in the media, we see like, you know, people going back to prison all the time, but we never s ask why. Like what are the challenges for people when they're released? And I just want to, I think this is like a really great video and I just want to maybe like end this presentation with us like really checking out this video and then any conversations after would be cool. Lady Justice was truly refined. Nonviolent offenders wouldn't spend decades confined. All three petty crimes. Three strikes, you're out of time. But that is a story I'd rather not be mine. Maybe if my tone was lighter, so would my sentence be. Statistics prove that, but by the numbers is not how I want history to remember me. Not as one of the 700,000 released from the Fed this year. Not as part of the majority who were expected to return right back here. No, I have a name. And the light who gave me it shall see her son return. Wrap her arms around me while her cheek muscles burn. To the point the warmth melts away every ounce of concern. <laughs> until the Quality Housing and Work Responsibility Act is learned. Public housing agencies are authorized to deny housing to felons. No longer locked up, just locked out. But I believe opportunity knocks for those who put in the work. Those with goals and drive, unafraid of their ego being hurt. Start from the bottom, plant my seeds in the dirt. A man willing to earn and prove every penny he's worth. Then I'm told my conviction comes with restrictions on professional licenses and permissions to gain employment as a medical technician or in the law division, no firefighter missions, and in most cases, if the prison box is checked, your resume goes missing. No longer locked up, just locked down.
I was born the road to be bumpy after I was set free. To not get down when the winds treat me like debris. Follow my aspirations, go get myself a degree. History, science, literature, maybe trigonometry. Maybe employers would talk more if I mastered chalkboards, but I'm banned from getting grants or a scholarship fund that's shown the front door. No longer locked up, just locked out. Dear Senator and Congressman, you need to be aware of the truth. One in three black men are under control of the criminal justice system in their youth. This is no conspiracy theory, there is factual proof. Can't you hear my voice? Why are your ears aloof? Probably I've denied your efforts because me and nearly six million others' votes aren't allowed at the booth. Our voices are silent. No longer locked up. Just locked out. There are paths for some, for others there are holes, echoing of struggle and our past returning calls. When our efforts receive no merits and we keep hitting walls, I gently ask you pardon me in case I once again fall. So the issues post-incarceration, as you can see, kind of continue and in many ways are exacerbated because now you are a criminal, you are an ex-offender. Um, while this piece speaks to a lot of the collateral consequences post-incarceration, one aspect of it that it doesn't touch on, which I just want to really um, speak to really quickly, is the impact on family. Right, like we often have these conversations and we talk about the people that are directly impacted, yet we don't speak about the indirect impact, right? We don't speak about the, the millions of children who have a parent incarcerated, right? We don't speak about the impact on mothers. I remember personally, one of the hardest things I had to do when I was incarcerated was to call my mother, right, and tell her that I was incarcerated. And, you know, as a parent, I can only imagine what that feels like for, a parent to know that their child is in a position that they cannot do anything for, right? Um, my mom tells me to this day, there are four boys, including myself, and my mom tells me to this day how hard it is for her to go to bed at night if everyone's not home, at least the ones that still live at home, right? And so like the, the collateral consequences of this system, they're almost impossible to, to capture. Right? This is a system that impacts people in every aspect. The internalization of it for people who have been incarcerated is substantial. The internalized inferiority, the internalized criminality right, is substantial. Communities are destroyed. Right, the, the impact within communities, communities are destroyed. This system has destroyed humanity. And I say that, you know, like not lightly. This is a system that's essentially destroying humanity, right? We can't, this is not a white problem, a black problem, a purple problem. This is a human problem, right? And I think till we see these issues as a human problem, we don't have the change that is necessary. Till we see that we're also impacted by this, we don't have the change that's necessary. So I really ask people to think very much deeper about these issues and what their roles and responsibilities can be towards change. And I know Allison will help you to really understand like some of the work that's being done in New York, in, in Pennsylvania, in Philadelphia, and especially at SP2 that you can become more involved in. Um, I don't know if we're gonna ask questions a little bit or maybe we can save questions. If people have 
questions they'd like yeah. to ask now, clarifying questions, go sure. ahead, otherwise you can yeah. have them at the end. Thank you. Um, Kirk did such an amazing job of, I think, framing the, the problem and the scope of the problem and the um, severity of the problem. So I often talk about some of that stuff at the beginning and I'm going to kind of quickly move through some of that, although I do have some numbers for Philadelphia specifically that I'll talk about. Um, but um, again, I'm we're talking about the Center for Cultural Communities today. That's a, um, an agency that I'm a part of running through SP2 um, that provides reentry support and other kinds of services to people um, in the West Philadelphia community, but, and, but really anyone in Philadelphia. Um, so specifically people who are coming out of incarceration, um, who are on probation and parole. And I'll talk more about, um, more about that as we go. Um, in terms of incarceration, as Kirk has already summarized for us, um, we're number one in the, in the world, um, just the largest incarcerated population in history. I think there are a lot of um, different ways that people try to drive this home, and I think different things sort of land for different people. So there are like visual things, and they're you know, saying these are the risk factors for this group and this group. And I mean, really, I think it's just an attempt to sort of um, drive home that this is just unprecedentedly enormous. It's just a huge problem. And I think it's one of those things that, you know that metaphor people talk about with the boiling water? What is it, frogs? Is that who? Frogs, they don't, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> frogs, um, you know, you can put them in a pot of water and slowly turn up the heat and they won't realize the water has begun to boil and they won't jump out and they'll just die in the hot water. And I think that this is really, um, this mass incarceration problem is something very much like that. It's just sort of crept up on us um, in a way that we've come now to think that this is just kind of normal. And so then sometimes radical solutions sound radical, but it's really a radical problem that we have. And so radical solutions are the only kinds of solutions that make sense for a radical problem. Um, this is actually, I was thinking of this graph when you were talking about Reagan and Bush, um, because you can really see it here. I mean, this is like, at the end of those um, presidencies. And I think it really can give us an idea of, you know, this is when the war on drugs started. So we can really get a sense here of incarceration numbers that are not directly linked to substance use and then incarceration numbers that are, you know. So we can really see we had a pretty steady baseline there for a while, right? And then suddenly, pew, war on drugs. So we are, um, we are certainly incarcerating many, 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 many people for drugs, and that's just the bottom line. I think people will kind of have us believe sometimes that um, that you know that that's not such a significant factor in our mass incarceration rates as it is. But in fact, we can see here that that's really a driving force. Um, so we've talked about these national rates, but I want to point out that in Philadelphia, we can see here how much higher our rates of in incarceration are, even compared to the national U.S. rates, which we already established are intensely high compared to anywhere else in the world. So in Philadelphia, we're really, really seeing um, kind of an epicenter of the epidemic. Um, 810 per 100,000 compared to 341. Um, that number is, again, significantly higher when we focus on um, African-American folks in Philadelphia. We're now looking at 1,267 per 100,000 incarcerated. Um, Kirk talked about this as well. One in three African-American men between 18 and 40 will be incarcerated at some point. Um, and that's even higher in Philadelphia. Um, something is considered an epidemic when it impacts 1% of the population. Um, and for some of these communities, we're talking about 25% or even more within certain communities. So just so far beyond um, something that would be considered an epidemic at this point, which is why it's called the new Jim Crow. Um, and as Kirk talked about, it's really um, it's, it's not something that impacts people as individuals, it's something that impacts a whole community, and it's something that's really um, about replacing the slavery system, as he said. Oops. Um, another thing that people reference, there are more um, black men who are incarcerated today and who are involved in the incarceration system than there were at the height of slavery, who were involved in slavery at the height of slavery before the Civil War. So just um, decimating this community. Um, and as Kirk talked about, yeah. women of color are the fastest growing prison population. Um, here in Philadelphia, we, um, we talk about that a lot and we're interested in why that is and what we can do about that. Certainly, um, 
incarceration over substance use is a factor there. Um, there's also, um, we know that there are high incarceration rates of women due to sex work, um, and that's something that we've been, as our center, um, trying to intervene with, and I'll talk more about that. Um, so reentry in Philadelphia. We have the highest probation and parole population here in Philadelphia in the country. Um, just to give a quick, sometimes these words can get confusing, like what's the difference between probation and parole and what does that mean? So generally when we're talking about probation, we're talking about a period of time when someone is being monitored by the system after they've completed their sentence. So a person might be sentenced to this many months or years of incarceration and then this much time of probation. And so that's a time when they're being monitored, but they are technically, um, they've completed their incarceration sentence. When we're talking about parole, um, we're talking about people who have been um, released before the end of their incarceration sentence. So the system thinks that that person is technically still incarcerated in many ways, but they are not within the prison any longer. But the reason that's important is because it helps us understand something that's very key um, to this whole process, which is that people who are on probation or especially parole, but certainly probation as well, are at a much much higher risk of reincarceration than people who aren't. You know, we hear about these recidivism rates, and I think that video really beautifully illustrated these barriers people face. And I think the other thing people don't understand is that many times when people are reincarcerated, it's not in fact as a result of committing a new crime. You know, it's not necessarily that the person is engaging in the exact behavior that they were engaging in before, which um, may or may not have in fact been criminal at that time, technically. but. You know, when you violate probation or parole, um, we talk about Meek Mill a lot here in Philadelphia, um, and you know, that's what we're seeing with Meek. What happened is, you know, that he, in, he violated the terms of his probation or parole. I actually forget now with Meek. But um, so, you know, what we're seeing is a technical violation, but that then results in reincarceration. So people who are, you know, have this kind of supervision are just at such an increased risk. They're drug tested, they're monitored, they're, people check on their housing. Um, we were just hearing recently that one of the wings of probation was having a problem, I think asbestos or something, so people had been moved, and so all these phone calls checking in got lost in the shuffle, and then warrants were issued for all these people who were on probation. So these kind of minor things can result in, you know, another person going back into incarceration, complete disruption of their lives, of their families, of their <coughs> work, of all the things they're doing. Um, so with people um, who are in reentry, two and three will likely be arrested within three years. Um, one in three of Philadelphia, people in Philadelphia, of Philadelphia's population has a criminal record. So we're talking now about one in three adults who are seeking employment, um, who are facing barriers due to that record, who are seeking housing and facing barriers due to that record. Um, any, you know, all these all these institutions that we sort of ask people to re-engage in. You know, this is what this is what successful reentry looks like. You should get a job, you should get, you know, housing, you should go back to school, you should do these things. But when you, we have these records, then all these doors, as we saw, close to people, and we're talking about one third of Philadelphians in that particular situation. It's just staggering numbers wise. Um, what that means is that in Philadelphia, um, for those of us who want to do something about this, we really have a huge opportunity. Um, there's a community need here that I said is we're really at the core of this epidemic here. And, um, you know, it's, it's kind of, as Kirk was saying before, that, you know, he used to try out words like mass incarceration or um, the new Jim Crow or I, people talk about the prison industrial complex. And those used to be words that, you know, um, only within a small circle of people would really resonate. And now these have become household household names in many ways, thanks to Michelle Alexander's work, thanks to the work of many people. But, you know, there, there's sort of a moment in time here where people are beginning to understand, like, we have to do something about this. You know, this is something that, like, middle-aged white ladies are talking about now. You know, we got to do something about this. Um, and then the, the moment is now. Um, you know, there have been some movements um, in Philadelphia and nationwide. These decarceration movements have started to pick up some steam to gain some attention. I think that, um, you know, the, the incidents we've seen of um, black men being um, shot by police and the social movements that have begun to form around that has really drawn attention. Even though those were more specifically about police violence, I think they really drew the nation's attention in general to the experience of the black community with the incarceration system, which begins for many communities with the police on the ground. So there's this um, idea that we have kind of a momentum and a moment in time. There's a a political opportunity here that we can take advantage of.
Um, and then, you know, we're saying that, hey, Philadelphia is the place. I mean, we are, we are seeing these numbers that are even um, dwarfing the, na the national numbers. And so where else but here to really see what we can do about this? Um, the other issue is that, you know, there's really no best practice that's been established with reentry. So we know some things that work for some people. You know, Kirk talked a lot about trauma. We know some things that help people um, heal from trauma, but we don't exactly have a best practice that really says, like, when people are coming home from incarceration, when they're in this reentry process, here's what works best. Here's what exactly what they need, and here's how to do it. We really don't have that. And so the hope is that as we keep working that through that we can really become a national model. We can say, look, this works, and um, you know, we'll, we'll train you how to do it as well. So the hope is that we can really um, kind of use Philadelphia as this lab to figure out what works and then um, take that nationally. I'm going to talk a little bit about the intervention that we use at the center. Um, and you know, in social work education, we um, talk a lot about these tracks that we have. You know, there's like a clinical track or a macro track or a policy. And, and we're always trying to help students think about how to integrate those different, um, those different tracks and to kind of say, like, how can we practice at all these different levels simultaneously as social workers? And that's one of the things that we were really deliberate about as we were thinking about how we wanted to intervene as a center is we knew we wanted to work with people in Philadelphia and to kind of form a community around that. But we also knew that um, you know, if we're not sort of doing something about the conditions that are creating this in the first place, then, you know, how much are we really doing? So we wanted to think about an intervention that could really work at all these different levels and to see how can we simultaneously kind of support individual people and then also attack the systems that are creating this problem in the first place. Um, so we have this intervention called GAINS. So the G in GAINS um, stands for groups. And this is our clinical modality. Um, and this is really um, our primary thing. So we do provide one-on-one um, -on -one support to people when they need it. We do crisis intervention one-on-one. -on -one. We do some case management one-on-one. -on -one. But really, our core modality is groups. Um, and there are a lot of reasons for that. We'll come back to and talk more about that. We use an intervention called CHATS. And I'll um, also explain a bit more. I'm just going to give you the overview now. Um, the A in GAINS is for advocacy. So this is about changing the political environment around incarceration. So this is when we're looking for opportunities to say, how can we begin to change the way people are thinking about this, the way they're talking about this, the way that they're making policies about this? How can we um, challenge probation to function differently in a way that will reduce incarceration numbers, et cetera? Um, and then the last is INS. And this is um, what we refer to as an integrated network of services. And our idea about this is just to say that, you know, we're going to need help, we need support, we need to create a network um, within Philadelphia that we can sort of use to create a safety net for people. So how can we find other people who are really concerned about this, who are already doing amazing things, and how can we collaborate with them and find ways to support each other and ultimately to support people who are coming home from incarceration and staying home from incarceration. Um, so this is really the the model um, overall, and I'm going to go through and talk about each one of these a bit more now. So why groups? Why not just do individual therapy with everybody? Anybody have thoughts about why groups might be a good idea for this community? Yeah. I would say because when you do a group, um, it's more than one. It's more than going to answer from one person. It makes it better because they don't know you, so they're not going to lie to you. Like that. Right. Great point. So like more heads are better than one when you're trying to solve problems, right? I think that's a great that's a great point. Any other thoughts about that? Yeah. Right. So kind of support and maybe like yeah, exactly, and not feeling so isolated in an experience. I think that's a great point. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Strength in numbers, right? Kind of a community <coughs> and a support there. Yep, I like that. Yeah. Anybody else? I don't want to pass anybody up. Yeah, I mean, you guys are doing my job for me. So, um, you're exa exactly those reasons. So, a collective process. You know, this idea that, um, you know, I would like to think that as a social worker, I would have some things to offer to someone, but I also understand that there are many, many things that I'm just not going to think of or not going to know about resources, ways people have figured out how to survive 
how to thrive that, you know, I just am not even familiar with. So we can come together, we can have this collective process where, as you said, you know, multiple heads are better than one and where we can really um, solve problems in that kind of way. Also, um, Richard, what you said, support, you know, just this idea that um, getting people together who can really relate, who really understand, who really know what it's like. I mean, I thought that was so beautiful how we saw in that video with when the one man um, became choked up and the other man was there and was just like, you got this and this is important and you need to say this and like, you know, gave him a minute, kind of gave him the support he needed and then encouraged him to speak and to say what he needed to say. And I think that's exactly um, the value of having, of bringing people together who have these shared experiences. Um, collective solution formulation. So specifically when we're talking about problems, I mean, I can't tell you the number of times that I've just been sort of stumped like, okay, what are we gonna do about that? And then someone's like, oh, well, there's this guy who does this. And if you call that guy and then this and that, and they're, you know, these elaborate, and I'm just like, oh, thank God you all are here. Cause I just, you know, would have no idea. I mean, sometimes it really just, people have, everyone has some small piece of the solution that we need and those pieces come together in the group. Um, also the idea of peer accountability. You know, people really in a group process come to care about how other people in the group um, experience them. Do they come to care about sort of the, the group as a whole? And so I think there's also an accountability that can come from being in a group of sort of saying, you know, I. I made this commitment to the group. You know, I told the group I was going to do this or I was going to work on this or I know that everybody in the group really cares about me and is pulling for me and so that becomes a way of um, kind of experiencing accountability. Um, also in our groups, so we use this model I referenced already called the CHATS model and it's really a, um, it's grounded in motivational interviewing and cognitive behavioral therapy for the social workers among us. These are like the old favorites um, and I think that um, it's really, um, it really kind of gets at the, the heart of the, of the two things that we um, most are trying to address with the intervention, which is, you know, kind of trying to keep each other um, motivated in spite of all of these barriers. I mean, it's very daunting to just face all of these barrier after barrier, and people sometimes have tried many times. You know, they've come home, they've felt motivated, and then life happens, you know, it beats you down, it's very difficult. So I think this idea that really the group is there um, to kind of provide that motivational support for each other as we go. Um, there are a few processes that we've um, kind of had to tweak in the group as we've gone along. As I said, this is a process of trying to figure out what works. So, um, you know, those of us who are social workers there have had some group training. You know, we've read Yalom and that's kind of a foundation that we went in with. But we also started to realize that there are times that we have to think differently about what people need and about what works. So one of the things, um, is that we really, we really see the clinical group as a community builder. So often in groups they talk about um, these boundaries where you kind of don't want people in the group necessarily to interact with each other outside of the group. You know, it's kind of can mess up the group. What we realized is that people really need community and especially, um, you know, one, th one challenge that I think a lot of people face is they come home, they're right back into the community they were in before. There are sometimes many wonderful things about their, that community. There are also sometimes many challenges where people face the expectation that they're going to kind of fall right back in line with where they were before. And so um, often people talk about this idea that like I need people to be around who are also trying to do something different like I am. And so there's a, a need for a new community as well. So that's one of the things that we realized is that um, actually encouraging people to become friends and to hang out outside a group and to really be there for each other in other ways became an important thing. Um, we also became really flexible, um, and what I mean by that is that we, you know, try to start on time, but people can really get there when they get there. What we realized is that we don't ever want to say, you know, here's this thing, and if you can't make this thing, then this is no longer available to you. So, you know, we, we found that we were in the beginning really trying hard, like, okay, everybody, we gotta, next week we're all going to get here on time, and then finally we were like, people are going to get here when they can get here, <laughs> and that's going to be fine. So, you know, I think also flexibility about attendance. Um, sometimes people come every week. There are lots of people who come every week. There are also people who come like once every few weeks. There have been people who we've not seen before for six months and then walk back in the door one day. And they're just welcome with open arms because the idea is that this just needs to be there for those people and not, you know, for us and to sort of make our like way of thinking about the group, you know, easy for us. But it really just has to be this flexible and open thing. So that's worked well. Um, people tease me because I send 
text message reminders every week um, to everyone on our list. So I just will still text people unless they tell me to stop for like months and months. And it's so funny though, because people have come back and just been like, you know, I just thought like if this lady is still thinking about me, like I'm just gonna go, you know, I'm just gonna go back. And so yeah, my like annoying persistent text messaging sometimes helps. Um, we also talk a lot about um, intensive confidentiality. It's sort of too bad it has to be called that. It probably should just be called confidentiality. But one of the ways that we've seen um, people's rights really systematically stripped away from them in this system is um, this right to confidentiality essentially just disappears. So people who are getting any kind of treatment or support, um, you know, those providers are providing reports to their probation and parole officers or to their judges or, you know, their drug testing and then providing those results or their, you know, any kind of, so all this communication and what that creates is a, <coughs> a situation where there's no space that's safe to talk about what's actually going on um, because people are fearful that anything they say in those spaces could then be reported. And as social workers, we, I think we often feel um, kind of put in those situations where we become almost like surveillers instead of, um, you know, uh, social workers. And so what we've done is just kind of drawn a really firm line and said, we just don't share anything. I mean, we are, we're mandated reporters, so we um, obviously adhere to those kinds of mandated reporting things, which we're really clear with people about. But ultimately, um, you know, we just don't provide reports on people to anyone else in the system. And it's been interesting trying to negotiate that because the system is certainly used to, so they'll say like, oh, well, we just, I had him sign a release. And we sort of ask like, sure, but what is the, what is the meaning of a release in this kind of a situation? Like what choice did that person have? You know, is this release that we just sort of say like, no, oh, sorry, your release is no good here. Now that said, we do sometimes understand that some forms of communication with judges and with POs really is helpful to people. Um, and so, you know, we'll have conversations about that kind of stuff and say like, hey, have you thought about, you know, talking to your PO about what's going on? That might be a good idea. So th those kinds of things will happen collaboratively, but um, we're really, really rigid about that. And what we've found is that, um, first of all, people are shocked by it because they're just so used to the expectation that they have no rights. Um, and secondly, that, um, people can really then open up and really share. We've had people who um, have been, you know, absconded is what they call if you fail to report to probation and they put out a warrant for you. So people who've been on the run, um, we've had one person on the run for 11 months and came to group the whole time. Um, he called me the first week and he was like, some of them call me Allie, and he's like, Allie, uh, if I show up to group, am I gonna get arrested? <laughs> And I was like, no, you're not going to get arrested. You know, and he's like, all right, all right, I'll be there. Um, and it's really, it's really amazing. So when new people come now, it's funny because I think they're sort of expecting it to be the thing that they're used to, which is that, um, you know, there's not much privacy or confidentiality. And so sometimes when someone who's been in the group for a long time will open up and maybe start talking about their substance use or talking about something like that, the new person just looks all freaked out. Like, are you really telling these people about this? Like, are you telling this white lady about your drug use? But, um, you know, then people kind of get this, get the, um, the signal from people that like, no, it's okay, you're safe here. And so that's been something that we've um, had a lot of success with and really come to understand as, critical to the groups. Um, let me see how I'm doing the time. And then um, lastly, we, um, we train people who are in the groups to become co-facilitators of the group. So we have a process where we support them in um, learning the model and in co-facilitating groups so that um, ideally, you know, the way that we would like to see our groups um, function is that they're facilitated by a social worker and by someone who's been certified as a a co-facilitator who's a peer, and that um, has been really great. You know, people who aren't interested in it totally don't have to do it, but people, many people who are, and I think it really becomes um, an important process for people to, it's, I think, a very empowering. I think the idea that the clinical model is made transparent to people, so it's not this sort of like magical therapy dust we're sprinkling, but we're saying, this is what it is, this is how it works, we can all do it together, um, is important. So I'll take you quickly through the model. I don't want to like give you a full, you know, training, but just so you have an idea of how it works. So um, basically, we all go around and we talk about challenges. So people talk about, um, you know, just what they've really experienced in the last week. What are the challenges you're facing um, to to successful, you know, reaching goals? 
Um, and then we talk about what are the alternatives to that. So the A in chats is for alternatives, which can sometimes mean avoid. Um, so is that, is that a challenge that could be avoided altogether? If not, how can we minimize the impact of that challenge? So how can we um, you know, think of alternative ways to engage with that challenge? Um, the third thing is triumphs. This is a, my favorite thing because um, it's just a chance to talk about what's going well. Um, so sometimes in, it's in relation to the challenge. We might say, you know, was there a time when you faced this similar challenge that you were able to more successfully manage it? But often it's just kind of like, what's going well? It just gets us out of these sort of problem-infused narratives that we can get stuck in. And one of the things I really love about it is that I've noticed that um, just the practice of asking people every week what, what went well um, people start to notice what goes well in their own lives and they become, because they know they're going to be asked and so they're sort of like, come in like, oh, I've been sitting on this triumph all week, I can't wait to tell you. And sometimes we skip the first part and just jump to the triumphs because people are excited. But it's a really nice way of, you know, also just noticing the good things that are going on. Um, and then the S in chats is solutions. So then what we do is sort of look ahead to the next week and say, um, you know, what are some things we can try? Let's, let's strategize here, let's come together as a group. What are some ideas, you know, what are some, what are some things to, to try and see if we can overcome some of these challenges? Um, typically in a group, you know, let's say with maybe seven or eight people, um, everyone will really share challenges to kind of give us a, a chance to see where people are. And then people who really have pressing things they want to talk about, we'll spend a little more time with those people. But um, yeah, so this is how the, the model works in the group. Um, just to summarize the advocacy stuff, um, first we think about the advocacy in terms of our kind of internal organizational environment. So before looking outside, we kind of wanted to say like, what do we want it to be like here? We, what do we want the climate in the center to be like? How do we want this to work? Um, and one of the things that we knew is that we, you know, people who've been incarcerated have experienced enough hierarchical spaces. We really wanted something that was collaborative and that really belonged to the people who um, who it's there to serve. So we talk about this idea of um, anti-capitalist organizational culture. And what we mean by that is we, we started by thinking about trauma and trauma-informed culture. And then we also had this thought that, um, you know, can we go back even farther than that? Like, what is really the source of the trauma? Um, and in many ways, you know, it's these, capital, these capitalist processes, and Kirk talked a lot about this, you know, that, that people who are disenfranchised from those, people who are left out, um, people who are marginalized by those processes, um, who, you know, basically people who aren't good at capitalism for various reasons, not individually, but, you know, sort of structurally. Um, that's really the source of this trauma. So how can we think differently within our organization about how to function around those things? Um, so I'll talk a little bit about what some of those mean. The first is the transparent clinical intervention. So if you ask anybody who comes to our groups, like, what kind of therapy is there? They'll either say CBT or they'll say chats, but they know it. You know, they know what it is. They know how it works. Everybody knows the chats thing, people. Um, so this idea that, you know, this is just something that is um, available to everyone the same. You know, we're not um, kind of doing secret, um, secret therapy interventions. Um, we also have a process of sharing money as a community. Um, I won't spend a bunch of time on that, but we, we did just come to realize that there are some crises that just can only be solved by money. You know, just this is the bottom line. And so we have a fund and we, um, it's available to people. People can borrow from it when they have a crisis. And then the idea is that when things stabilize, if they can, they put the money back into the fund and it's available for others. So um, we've had success with it. In some ways, there are challenges as well, but certainly um, you know, it's been critical in just kind of addressing some specific crises that come up that are just really rooted in, like if you can't pay this, then everything's gonna fall apart. Um, so that's something that we found and again, we just kind of figured that out over time. We were like, people just sometimes need like a little bit of money they can borrow. You know, that thing that many of us have, which is like a parent we can go to or a friend we can go to or someone like that, you know, sometimes that's missing. And so um, I talked about this, the group co-facilitator certification. Also just collective decision making and sort of open management meetings. We just tend to do things together. So if we're all meeting to talk about something going on with the center or what we want to do, we just have it in the main room, and if people are around and people want to come and be a part of it, um, everyone's welcome. So it's just a space where we really value um, everyone's perspectives about that stuff. Also, um, people are really encouraged to advocate for themselves and also for each other. So, um, 
you know, it's not at all uncommon for people to kind of take up each other's causes, either within the center and certainly with outside of the center. You know, if someone has um, a court hearing and people hear about that, they'll say, okay, well, when is it? And, you know, it's not at all unusual for two or three other people just to show up to court and just to be there as a show of support for that person and to make sure the judge sees, you know, this person is part of a community and they're really important to that. Um, and I just included this here. Um, I really wanted like a slogan, you know, and I, we were having trouble thinking of something and then one of the guys from the group um, one day just said this, um, abandon apathy, embrace empathy, and I thought it was so great, so we made it our um, official slogan. Um, whoops. Also, um, in terms of advocacy in the external political environment, um, it's really just a matter of looking for any opportunities that we can <coughs> find to talk to stakeholders, to you know, put pressure on people who have power to think about things differently, to educate. So um, TJ has done a few different presentations at city council where he'll go. He specifically talked a lot about the impact of um, marijuana drug testing. So initial charges for marijuana, but also the experiences of people who are on probation who are being reincarcerated for marijuana. Like I think that people don't think that happens still and just to be clear and we are very very just now in a moment with the DA's office where they're agreeing to not pursue those anymore but it's a complicated situation because you know the DA is in the position to um, to sort of prosecute those but probation and parole are the ones making the decisions about the testing and about you know the violating so that's still happening and we do still have people who are being reincarcerated for testing positive for marijuana so things like that kind of issue where we're really just saying like there are you know white people in Colorado making millions of dollars off of this and like poor black folks in Philadelphia are still going to prison it's just you know really crazy making um, but yeah so then judges um, the DA's office we were really involved in the um, Krasner campaign and we've been really excited by some of the changes that are coming about since his election um, etc um, this is um, one of the things that we try to do is really um, encourage people who are part of the community to engage in that act advocacy we found that it's really like a kind of a dual purpose thing where people are both um, you know, telling their stories and making an impact and really influencing people. And also, it's really like a clinical intervention for the person. I think people are kind of gaining mastery over their life narratives. You know, they're feeling empowered in, um, and speaking out against a, si a system that has been so disempowering to them for so long. So um, I have a couple quotes here from a, um, a talk that one of our, his name isn't really John, you guys are gonna know who it is. I always just, if he's not here, I put like a little different name. But he says, um, what I know that I like doing now is not necessarily consciously being an advocate, but telling my story and telling other people's stories that I get to mentor. It's a chance to get with my cohorts and colleagues and just tackle different discussions and present it to groups that are a little disconnected as far as knowing what the real problems and challenges are that we face. And all they have to do is just have a conversation with us. Not that we're the experts, but we're the experts. We know. And that's what's been wonderful, like I shared, like last night. And I knew, I knew I was the expert in there. And there were some big wigs there. And so to hobnob and rub elbows with these people and to enlighten and educate them is the thing that excites me. Again, I know what I want to do with the rest of my life. And doing that and then convincing the young guys in my hood or the guys from the carceral community here that, yo, you too can come in there. And you don't necessarily have to get a college degree, but you do have to know how to talk and tolerate. If you can do those two things, you'll build on that and you'll be surprised at how far it'll take you because I can't even believe, sometimes it's surreal that I'm in these rooms, that I'm in these conversations. Um, so I think this is just a nice illustration of the impact personally for people to have those opportunities to be engaged in that kind of advocacy um, and the, you know, the sort of impact it can have on them as well as of course the, you know, the work that they're doing. Um, this I won't spend a ton of time on, but this is just a some of our partners in this integrated network of services. So you'll see um, Philadelphia Community College. Ah, here it is. The Reentry Support Project at Community College of Philadelphia. Um, that's something that, you know, one of the things we've been really committed to is thinking about how we can reverse this um, school to prison pipeline, as Kirk talked about, and really create like a prison to school pipeline. You know, how can we just really create pathways for people um, to say, listen, you know, this is available to you and there's another, you know, there's another support there. 
Um, we, um, let's see, have been doing some exciting work with, um, where did they go? Why is it hard for me? Ah, Quaker City Coffee. I don't know if you guys have heard of them. Go buy coffee there if you haven't. Um, they have a shop at 10th and Locust, but they also kind of sell wholesale coffee, and they are um, really committed to hiring people who have um, histories of incarceration, and we've been providing some psychosocial support to them um, as well. But, you know, just kind of trying to get um, partners all across the city. The mural arts program we've been working with, um, Annika, our social worker who's here, does um, this ladies' night, which is um, on Tuesday nights at Prevention Point, and it's an outreach to sex workers in Philadelphia. Um, really difficult to reach population with really high risk of incarceration, lots of needs, and um, Annika's done an amazing job of just um, connecting with that community and building a bridge for us. So um, lots of exciting partnerships there. It's really difficult, though, I'll say. I mean, it's hard working with others, you know? We, we struggle, but it's something that, you know, I think we're all really trying to stay committed to because I think that's the, that's the way we're gonna do this is by really getting, you know, all of these players in the city on board. Um, I'll talk quickly about some outcomes. So we've, um, we've been operating for about four years, almost four years. Yeah, almost four years. Um, so we've had, um, we have clients through a few different places. So we have people who come directly to our center. We also have clients at CCP who we see in groups there. We have clients at Prevention Point through Ladies Night. So we kind of have people in different settings, but we've seen about 125 people throughout the past year, about 250 since we started the program, um, and that about 45 of those are people who we would consider kind of high need, so people who at some point or other we've been engaged with intensive case management with. That may not always be, you know, throughout the entire time we're working with them, but they have periods of really high intensive need. Um, and then about 15 of those are people we would describe as high risk, and those are people who historically have um, experienced reincarceration within two to three months of being released. Um, and this is um, just a quick summary. You can kind of see where we are with maintaining either education or employment. Now, certainly people are often um, underemployed. You know, they're, it's, it's, they're sometimes short-term work. It's sometimes unstable. But we have had essentially opportunities um, to see almost all the people we've been working with either engage in employment successfully or in schooling. Um, and then in terms of reincarceration, we've only had two people who have been um, reincarcerated. We do, so the way we define that, because it's so common for people to be detained for short periods of time. So when we talk about reincarceration, we're talking about people who have been sentenced to more periods of incarceration. We have had people who've been um, either detained by probation or parole or rearrested. And fortunately, in those cases, we were able to um, you know, work with them, work with other people who are supports to them and um, have them come home and have them not be resentenced in those situations. So we have had people who've had very, very, very close calls, but um, this is where we are. So I want to um, wrap up by inviting um, a couple people to come up. This is, a, by the way, a picture of um, a little Super Bowl party that we had. Quaker City Coffee um, let us use their coffee shop, and we like schlepped a TV. Um, in the rain from my house um, and watch the Super Bowl there. I was um, I was out of town for my mom's birthday, and um, so, but I got to like FaceTime with everybody right at the end of the Super Bowl and hear them all screaming. But um, you know, it's really, and that was like an idea that people in the group had. I mean, we didn't really think of that. Somebody just was like, look, we're worried. You know, this is a really like, party, fun, wild time in the city right now, and there are so many opportunities, you know, to get caught up in stuff going on. Like, can we plan a thing to do together that would just be safe? Um, and we're like, yeah, that's a great idea. That sounds good. So my son made potato salad. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Potato salad. Um, but yeah, so they had a good time. So as we're wrapping up, though, um, since we do stuff as a community a lot, I told people in the group about speaking here today and asked if anybody wanted to come and participate with me. So a couple of people did. So why don't you guys come up here and I'll introduce you quickly, Richard and Reese. And I asked them if they would be willing to come and just um, just talk about their experiences um, in reentry, their experiences at the center. I don't know, do you guys wanna sit? How are you comfortable? You wanna sit? We have these fancy chairs here for you. All right, you sit too. Um, so 
uh, this is Richard and this is Reese, and um, they've been part of this, both of them have been part of the center for some time. And I asked them if they would just talk about um, their experiences. I was thinking just kind of what you feel like has worked for you, maybe what hasn't, what, what you feel like people in reentry need, what, um, you know, what your experiences have been in general. Whatever you want to say would be great. But I can ask you more specific questions if that would help. So let me know. Do you want to start, Richard? Yes, though. Okay. All right, I'm Richard. I'm just going to give you a little brief for you right now. I've been incarcerated most of my life. Ever since the age of 11, I've been in and out of systems. From 11 all the way up to 58. I've done a whole lot of juvenile time. Troubled my grandmother to death. She couldn't sleep like he was saying earlier. You know what I mean? She can't sleep because I'm out in the street. So I used to run around getting a lot of trouble. I ended up going to penitentiary doing seven years. Still didn't have enough. Came home, didn't have no safety net to fall back on. Can't blame nobody. I got to take responsibility myself. Went back to 21 years. Came home, went back to three years. I know y'all probably said, woo, this boy's crazy. But <laughs> that was just my journey. Uh, this last time I was incarcerated, after I came home, I changed my perspective. I said I wanted to do something different. I done tried everything else. So. I got in community college through the Greek program. And met Annika. She told me about the center. This is how I made it that. We start building. What's the center like? You and me, I was real curious, inquisitive. So she put me in on the center. I start coming to the center. And the center was a real connected place. And I felt like I was home. You know, because when I came home from prison, everybody was deceased. My mom, grandmother, grandfather, brothers and sisters. So you know, I was like on my own. All I had was my old friends, and I already knew what that lifestyle was about. Eventually, I get caught up and go back again, because they didn't care, you know what I mean? They see you, they, they have you home, whatever. But anyway, now I'm in the center, and the center has been a real structure for me. And it's helped giving me back my vision, helped enlighten me to a lot of different things. It brought all the <coughs> good things that I got inside of me, that I knew that I had inside of me all my years, that shine, you know what I mean, through God, you know what I mean, that birth. I knew I had it, and I knew I could accomplish a lot of things, so they had taught me a lot of things. And this is where I'm at right here, with this expectation of the center is a beautiful place. It's well connected. They help each other. It's very supportive of one another. We reach out, we talk to each other, we talk about all kinds of things, personal and unpersonal. And clinically, where is that? I'm gonna let me see some <laughs> This is not a paid commercial. No, I'm just kidding. I'll, I'll buy you lunch for real. Yeah. <laughs> what you think? Well, I want to say I wanted to say so. I remember when I first was in the room last year. It was um, I just first met Professor DJ. It was um, Larry Krasner, and it was um, it's a colleague. And I was part of the GR at the time. It was this girl. I can't remember her name. I think her name was Jolly. I think it was Jolly. But she was telling me who the professor was and everything he did. So I really had no clue who he was. I mean, I knew who he was. I didn't know what he was doing. So I seen him at the campaign all the time. We talked. We laughed. We did a regular speech we always do. One plus one can get the people to come out and vote. So um, when I put the GR, Richard came up to me and said, um, you know, we should come back to the center. We're going to meet you at the center. I said, all right. I thought about it, and I went to check the center out. And what I noticed personally about the center is I look at it like it's a basketball team. The triangle play. I feel like it's a triangle. You got the point guard, which is Professor. You got the shooting guard, which is Allison. You got the center, which is Annika. <laughs> <laughs> the, oh, man, the, this the is structure amazing. That makes it work. Because when people do these programs or these social workers, you got to genuinely care to do this. Because some people would do it, but they might not care. Now, as I'm in New Jersey, so I always don't say much. When the professor let me get caught there, and let's say the token is running out, they really be stressing. <laughs> Philadelphia is doing away with the token situation and a lot of us who you know that's one of the ways we support people come into group and we've just been stressing out because it's like and then also we're spazzy and we like forget sometimes so then yeah but we've it's been yeah a stress because they come out their pockets and give you money when people come out their pockets they care in my opinion when they start giving you money out their own pocket time on the table to make sure you get home because they run up on some people and that's all I've been with the center. I think I've been with them since October. Yep. I feel like I've been with them. And I can say these are some of the best people that I've met. I met a couple people in prison. It's like five people actually I say I met. I was just talking to people in GRI. 
and I'm getting arrested for it. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, in the here for you. And that's what you need a social work. People that care for you, like, you know what, I'm going through something. I need to really talk to my mom probably without them judging me. And that's what I learned from being with the center. That's why I stick with the center. Like when I'm, I'm doing volunteer work at um, a women's shelter, Professor Annika, they come out of nowhere. I'm like, is she in a room with you? Now I don't tell them what I do at the, um, the shelter. I just walk in there, Jeff and I be sitting there. I was in the walk in like, is somebody in the room with you? Are you doing this? Are you doing that? And that makes me so that they really care because they don't have the way to remember that I'm doing this. And I don't talk to them about what I'm doing. So Reese is one of the people who's, um, done the certification process as a co-facilitator and then he's been you know using some of those skills as a volunteer at a women's shelter um, where he's been going and so he you know was just saying that we were really excited for him about that and we've also just been kind of helping him think through all the you know implications and boundaries and safety and just really supporting him in that work he's doing there because it's really it's really amazing and it's been um, you know it sounds like such a gift to that community there that you've been um, providing. Um, I also, I know we're going to do some questions and we're kind of, so maybe we can like also le let these guys hang here for question time if anybody has questions for them too. Would that be good? Do you want to come up Kirk though in case people have questions for you as well? Because I think we're down to, the, oh. <laughs> I think we're down to the last 15 so I want to make sure people get to ask you questions too. I have the thing but the mic, yeah. I know, sorry, I spring extra people on you. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Okay. Roll Richard over, there we go. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> Thanks. Any questions? Jeff. I mean, I, I, this is probably will turn into a question, but um, <laughs> actually, like ever since uh, Dr. Kirk, um, Dr. James was up there, and, and you too, Allison, because you so you mentioned uh, marginalized uh, populations, communities. But um, so I pulled up. So I've probably read um, the New Jim Crow twenty times. It's like like my book sits right beside my bed. And I, and what I what I pulled up here was um, on page two nineteen, and I I know this because it's like. So I pulled it up in my, I didn't want to get her wrong in, um, in quoting. It's fair to say that we have witnessed an evolution in the United States from the racial caste system, based entirely on exploitation of slavery, to one based largely on subordination Jim Crow, to one defined by margarine, mar marginalization, marginal, marginalization. You nailed it, um, yeah. A massive margin. Um, and so that, that, that whole statement right there is really like, it's really scary to me that like um, exploitation in slavery was, is like a better, you're better off in slavery uh, than you are today in mass incarceration. You're marginalized, you're um, insignificant, you're um, not cared for. And I, and I bring this really, really, it sort of really hit home the other day in my practice class. Um, you know, we're, we're asked to be in, uh, we're, we have this group project, and so we put up all these areas of, uh, you know, vulnerable populations. <laughs> and uh, three, of the, three of the things I put my name under were substance use, uh, being formerly, incar formerly incarcerated, working with this, this community, and HIV AIDS. And out of all, of, all three of those, there, including myself, there, were, there was one other person in substance use, there was one other person formerly incarcerated, and there was no one under HIV AIDS. And I, it just really goes to show, like, at, at least for mass incarceration, that, that, that these, these populist communities are, um, they're marginalized, and they're insignificant. I mean, and, and, it, and I say that, I say that even in a school of social work. Mm -hmm. And so I guess if I were to like, uh, pose a question. What and, and I did go through the um, um, the class of uh, about um, taking down the prison industrial complex. Um, but other than that, really, there's no classes. Which is a in, brand new class. Too. Yeah, I mean that's right. a new. And so that's only yeah. been around for yeah, yeah. Well, uh, one or two semesters. And so for 
years. What are some of the classes? I, I know you said that you created um, some um, coursework. Um, what could like what could how could we implement um, education about mass incarceration here at SB2? Really, if I were to pose this as a question, turned into a question shocking, yeah, beautifully. I'm sorry. That. That so Sounds long. like a good question for you. About. <laughs> so, again, my, I, I feel awareness is the start to any change of any problem, right? Uh, we can't have change till people really understand what the problems are. So for me, being formally incarcerated and being a social worker and really seeing the absence of these conversations in the profession, I think that I've always asked myself in every space, how can I contribute, right? So being here, um, one of the things I was instrumental in developing the JRI, um, there, I don't know if the mass incarceration course is still here, but I think just kind of like, you know, not to toot my own horn, but like being here, right? I think sometimes we don't see, we meaning people who are marginalized, people who have been impacted. Um, a, a colleague often says that the people closest to the problem are closest to the solutions, but oftentimes furthest from the resources, right? So when we have an opportunity, I mean, we have a degree of privilege being in these spaces, right? I think that. Um, these men who just spoke, right, they, they, had, they understand their responsibility, you know, and, and the power of their voice being in these spaces right now. So I think to maybe answer your question, right, it's not necessarily looking at a broader system, right? It's looking at really ourselves and seeing how are we creating awareness around these issues, right? And I feel my dissertation was titled The Invisible Epidemic in Social Work Academia, and it really looked at exactly what you just said, the absence of this information within social work, right? And so I felt it would be really important for me to develop curricula that speaks to that, right? Um, GRI was another aspect of that, right? We looked at the problems of reentry in Philadelphia and said, wow, how can we tackle this, right? Um, you know, and started to connect with Tara and other folks that were doing this work and, and create partnerships. So I, I ultimately always believe that this starts with ourselves, right? We often have this very external lens what, what are they doing, what are they doing, but it really starts with us, what are we doing, right? How are we having conversations in our classrooms about this issue? Am I bringing awareness to folks that may not have the same experiences that I do, right? Um, something in classrooms that I feel is really integral to is like no shame learning, right? And I think, you know, we're, we're also sensitive about oppression right now that we don't oftentimes allow for an inclusive conversation. Right, so again, realizing that I've had this experience and how can I take this experience to create awareness. So just constantly, I feel I'm constantly looking at what else I can do to cultivate awareness, understanding that nothing happens, no change happens so people really understand what the problem is. And as Allison said, this is a radical issue, right, which requires a radical solution. And a radical solution is something uh, Michelle Alexander, um, Angela Davis speaks about a lot, and it's really kind of looking at the root, right? Like how do we constantly push this conversation to look at the root of these issues, right? To look at capitalism, to look at colonialism, to look at racism, right? Like I, I think that we often make this a prison issue and this is not a prison issue, this is a human issue, mm -hmm. right? So to really like push and challenge even the starting points of these conversations and see what we ourselves are doing as well, I, I feel like is the ultimate starting point. Absolutely, and, and maybe I'll give you my card so this doesn't, like for people that don't care about New York, <laughs> right? They, they're like, why are we talking about New York? Um, but I think even maybe to answer your question, like um, regarding one thing, right? I think what's really important in this conversation 
as Allison again pointed out, is that we often have this dichotomy in our profession and how we see this, right? And I'm not saying that this is what you're doing at all. But, you know, we're like, I'm a clinical social worker, I'm a macro social worker, right? So I see these issues. And I think something really important is even as you begin to look at an organization that you would see yourself partnering with to do this work, is how holistically are they thinking about this issue, right? Because it's like, if you're a clinical social worker and you're totally focusing on um, behavioral change, I think that is highly oppressive, right? And if you're not able to integrate the entire spectrum, the entire experiences of what someone is doing, Right, so I think that is like how I think about this work is I, I don't want to work for an organization or work with folks that aren't, you know, like really looking at um, uh, this issue in a very broad construct, right? Because for many years, this has become like very like CBT oriented, right? Just like really show up and tell people to change your behaviors, right? And not to say there's anything wrong with that. People, we, if there is a problem here, we need to obviously, um, you know, react differently to this issue and, and, and have behaviors that are more um, aligned with our own safety and who we want to be. Yet at the same time, it cannot be exclusive of the broader systems of oppression that people are um, subject to, right? So I think when I think about organizations that are doing this work, that's one of the things I first look at, right? I'm like, how, you know, how holistic yeah. is this organization okay. and its mission, right? Are they seeing the bigger product, right? Um, someone else also said to me, which also resonates very deeply with me, is people consider jobs in this field, like, am I working to put myself out of business, right? Like, and, and I think you can only really work to put yourself out of business when you're looking at, you know, the root, going back to yeah. the idea of being radical, when you're looking at the root, where you have a lot of organizations where it's like, it's a numbers issues. And as these guys pointed out, right, like you can tell, you can tell when you show up in an organization and it's like, okay, here's another body, here's another contract versus like showing up and, you know, seeing the full person and seeing their um, humanity and seeing and validating, validating the totality of their experiences. I think that's great advice. And um, yeah, it's interesting about the clinical and the macro thing. I, yeah, you kind of made me think of something when you were talking about that. We have a saying that comes up in the group a lot. I don't remember who said it first. Maybe you guys will remember. But sometimes people will say, um, you're not wrong. You're on probation. Um, and it's a really, you know, I think an interesting thing because it sort of becomes this thing of, like, how can we um, support each other to survive within this very strange space that people find themselves, you know? So it's like we're sometimes not even getting the chance to think about like wellness, right? Like what would it, like how much marijuana does it make sense for you to smoke? Like how much is is too much for you or how much is, you know, because we can't even get there because it's like, well, if you have any marijuana in your system, then you, you know, are gonna go back to prison. So like, you know, so it's this interesting thing where I, you know, that this idea of, yeah, like purely clinical work is just a really confusing thing. And I think also, you know, when you're trying to ultimately kind of organize and community build with really vulnerable communities, um, people need support to have that capacity, you know? So I think people first have to be stable. They first have to have their basic needs met, you know? So a lot of the, even the direct work is honestly kind of in service of the community building because, you know, people can't participate meaningfully in the community if they don't have food, you know? So it becomes, or if they are like, totally inundated by PTSD symptoms or if they're, you know, have crippling depression. So it really kind of becomes this hand-in-hand -hand thing, like you said, yeah. Give you a card after. <laughs> yeah. I, I had a comment and a question. Uh, we have the same thing. I work in behavioral health, and so we use tokens. SEPTA does have a task force that you can go and be present and sort of voice your concerns about the new system and the fact that they're only doing two-way passes instead of one-way passes. And so if you have any interest stuff that is interested in hearing from providers that will sort of struggle with that. Yeah, um, that's good to know. Not that they'll change anything, but they are interested. <laughs> um, and they let you Oh, we will show up. They, Don't worry. They let you come to me, so that's, that's one thing. Yeah. Uh, Dr. James, the one thing that you said in behavioral health that's curious to me is you said that folks that are incarcerated um, are not diagnosed with behavioral health issues. Yeah. Um, and I wonder, some of our experience has been that it's not that they're not diagnosed, but there's no treatment. Mm -hmm. And that the treatment in uh, the prison, prison system is either antiquated or 
non-existent. And so I'm wondering if it's both of that, or if it's more, in your opinion, is it more of one or the other? And then we have folks that, you know, sort of rally to go to behavioral health because there's some perception that in behavioral health, it's different than being in general population. Yeah. So there seems to be a complicated issue yeah. on the receiving end of folks being, you know, re on the reentry. I wonder if there's yeah. some thought that you have of things that we should be thinking about on the receiving end. Well, I mean, I think it's all those things, right? It's, it's um, the, the services in prison are very antiquated. I think for folks that have been historically pathologized, you know, really kind of, again, sit in and understanding that there is a problem and actually willing to show up for a solution for that. And even for myself, right, I, you know, spent nine years in prison. And I remember doing my dissertation and really starting to look at, like, the impact of trauma in, you know, like, for people that have been incarcerated and how it plays out. Um, things uh, around attachment and how that plays out and, and really seeing myself, right? Seeing myself for the first time in a totally different light, right? Seeing relationships that went really wrong and kind of having a greater understanding of like what was taking place in my life during that time. So I, I think demystifying the stigma of mental health is critical, not only in, and I think when you talk about for the most part, you know, um, black men, you know, which, uh, you know, hyper masculinity and, you know, everything that comes with that, right? So even the vulnerability to show up, and I, I had a friend who recently came out of prison, he said to me, like, I've never ever said to someone I need help. He said, I've never ever said to someone in my life I need help, right? And I sat and thought about that, and I was like, wow, I can probably count on one hand the amount of times I've asked for help, right? So I, I think that it's, it's a confluence of things, as you said. I think what we can do, right, um, as people that are doing behavioral health, right, is really be mindful of how we show up for folks, right? As Allison said, what does our space look like, right? How are we, how are we receiving folks? What are the language we're using, right? How are we, um, you know, and one of the things that I learned here as well too, is that, you know, it's irrespective to, you know, our toolbox, irrespective to the, like, our clinical strength, the thing that is often the greatest is our ability to connect as humans. Right, so it's like when you speak about, and I won't speak for these men, but oftentimes for the people that end up in these spaces, right, we have not had a lot of humanity, right? A lot of people that ended up in prison have not had a lot of humanity in their lives, right? So the, the importance of someone showing up and validating their experiences, the importance of someone showing up and just saying like, I care. You know, I remember when the GRI, when we first started going into the prisons and how powerful that was, right, for, um, you know, folks to just come in and say, no, like, listen, we're, we're trying to figure out what we're doing, but, you know, we care about this issue and we care about you, and, like, we're here to help, right, and how powerful that was, right? So I think just, for me, it's always just understanding that we can never be experts on someone else's experiences and something else you said that I think is so powerful and just figuring out then what does a collaborative relationship look like right just making sure that we are creating spaces that allow for um, empowerment and collaboration I mean, I think anecdotally, just to quickly respond in terms of what we've seen, is it just seems really random. Like the people who end up in mental health court versus this, I mean, it's not necessarily people who I think are experiencing the most mental health symptoms necessarily. It feels pretty, people are sometimes in intensive substance use treatment and they're really not the people with the most, so it's, I feel like it's all over. It's just so, um, you know, inconsistent. I think it just depends on the path people take and, you know, once they get inside, I don't know. It's yeah, I think it's people are probably overdiagnosed and underdiagnosed. Yeah. You know, I think that's oh, probably sure. exactly right. It's just kind of and misdiagnosed and misdiagnosed. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, so my name is Anna. I am a um, second year um, NSOB student, um, and I have worked um, actually at DHS for a number of years. So I have worked with um, juveniles on both the descendant dependent and the delinquent side. But more importantly, I have my only sibling um, has been incarcerated for the past 21 years. So <clears throat> this question is actually for you two gentlemen because there is now a great possibility that he will be coming home. And so it is very interesting to me, um, I think not just my feelings, but my other family members' feelings of happy 
happiness, <coughs> but also mixed with apprehension because, you know, he and I have had this 20 year, 21 year relationship now behind bars, you know, really for both of us. And, you know, so I don't know. I don't know what to do with that. I don't necessarily know, you know, so what would you, I don't know, most want from, I guess, um, your family, your friends, Support, support and space, that's important. Because you know, after you've been incarcerated for a long period of time, inside is dehumanizing. You know, sometimes you got to be a barbarian. You know, you like in a field with a jungle around a lot of animals because we all, like sardines boxed in. We live in a little matchbox, sharing a cell with an individual you know nothing about, and they just throw people in your cell. So you got to get used to it. <coughs> then you got to get used to how the guards mentality towards you. See, when I first came to prison, we used to get nine cents for working. And that had to last us through the whole month, the eight hours. It was a lot of racism. It was a lot of beatings. It was a lot of whole time, meaning incarcerated inside another cell inside of a cell. We used to sleep on a slab, a real slab, brick. They come take our mattress at six o'clock in the morning with the water hole, shh, that's your shower. So you can imagine the mentality, the rage, the anger, frustration, the loneliness, missing family, not having them bonds. So him coming back out in society is gonna be real difficult because he had to retrain his whole mentality again. Because the world has changed. After I'd done all that time I'd done, technology was in effect. I didn't know nothing about computers, the phone. You know, I was illiterate to a lot of that stuff. And I thought I knew things from inside, reading, doing this and that. But when I came out here, it's a different function, a different way to, to conduct yourself. So you have to learn him again. And your family have to learn him because they haven't been around him. So they basically don't even know him. They know of him. Maybe the memories you may have shared, the pictures, talking about your visits or whatever. So he needs space and he needs support. And not to be pushed too fast. Because you don't know how fragile he is. You don't know how scarred he has become. Or the individual that he had to adapt in order to survive. Because it's rough, day in and day out. You, know, you see so many things in there that would shock you. And a lot of y'all might blow a fuse if you've seen it or been a part of it. So inside is a real cool, cool place. It ain't like a lot of people think because you got a TV, they survive, uh, supply you with a lot of things like clothes, underwear. You know what I mean? They ain't sugar like that. You know, you got to watch yourself all the time. Because it's like they say in mental. You don't know the next man next to you is messed up in the head. You know, I'd have seen some, in this, some this situations where a guy from another place was an immigrant and they was getting ready to deport him back to his place that he had to go. And he just took a bat one day because we used to play baseball and just bust a guy in the head because he didn't want to go back. So if he catch a new case, he can stay here. So I'm just giving you some ideas on his transition, you have to nurture him again. You know what I mean? Not like a baby, but you know what I mean? Have a support base for him. You know, so that way he don't come back in them old behaviors of how he was when he left come back in effect. Because we gravitate to what we know. And when we don't know the unknown, we're scared. But he might not tell you, I'm scared. Because you know, you gotta be mindful, you gotta be strong. You know what I mean? Because this is what he was taught. You know what I mean? This is how he survived. So you got to just be mindful of that. And just take your time with it. You know what I mean? Give him a little room. Let him breathe. Don't crowd him. Because sometimes when we come home, people want to crowd us up. But you got to remember, we had hands off inside. You know what I mean? Ain't nobody touching me. Ain't nobody getting close. I'm closing my heart. I'm shutting all kinds of doors. Because I got to be like this here. So hopefully one day I can get out there. Because if I be too soft, or if I be too relaxed, or if I be naive, then Hyrene is going to get me. You know, you don't want to be getting 
So just keep that in mind. You got some shit? Um, yeah. yeah. I, would, um, I would say, I remember when I came home, my brother took me to the club like two straight months. We did a lot of social events. So basically, what I would suggest is find out what he like, look up the research. If he into this and that, when he come home, it's good to be around family than um, be by yourself. Like I said, he took me to the club because he got me back social faster that way. So basically, when he come home, walks good, family around him good, see what he into. And you look it up, so when he come home, he be right into it. It's all about really like strategizing. So you're on the phone with him, you already know he's doing good. What you like to do? You know, you write it down, oh, let's get, oh yeah, we can do that, oh, I got you. Then you look it up, so when he come home, it's better to get right, in, right into it fast than sitting there. Like I said, I came home, I came home on, but Wednesday, I was in the club on a Saturday. <laughs> my brother took me to the club Saturday, 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 Saturday. So for two, three months straight, went to the club. And they got me social, so they got me back in the room. You know what I mean? So talking to the girls, I was back in, I was back in the groove. So that's what y'all do, just come on. As soon as they come out, just jump right in it. I mean, like Richard said too, though, but find out what he like, then you jump into that. So we're on the phone right now, you know he good, so you don't got like, how you doing today? Like, what do you like to do? Like, what you learn from me? All right, got you. You want to go to school? Okay. You want to do this? I got you. And he might maybe a little older, I don't know if he want to go to the club, and he might be a little old for the club, but he got cabarets, other stuff he could do, you know, and get him back in the rhythm. And that'll work. Reese will be his social just, planner. So. Just, just, to, just to say something with Reese said, that, that's funny that you said that. You know what I mean? That your family grabbed you and took you. Me, when I came, I had no guy, right? My dad had died, left me the house, right? So I said, Dad, I. I'm gonna get about knowing what's going on here. So I start going to the bar. I don't drink enough. I'm in the bar, just sitting in the bar. So like the third time I came in, the lady said, "Excuse me." I'm looking around. She said, "No, you." I said, "What's up?" She said, "Come here for a minute." She said, "Now you've been here three, four times. And you ain't brought nothing yet." I said. I don't even drink. She said, you don't drink, what you doing? I said, I'm trying to learn how to socialize. She said, socialize? Where you coming from? I said, shh. I said, what you can do? I said, you got them funny little things up there with the umbrella. I said, put me one of them together, fruit juice and stuff, and I can sit right here and just listen. And that's how I started learning. I'm listening to them over here, arguing over here. I said, oh, well, that kind of relationship. Oh, over here, I'm listening. So, you know, it's different things. It's different tactics. You know what I mean? That's what works for me. So I just, you know, I'm funny that he said that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Yeah. Tender. I was just going to say, um, I, for people who maybe don't know, there's the uh, there's something called the Juvenile Lifers in Philadelphia. And so they're being resentenced. So people who were sentenced to life sentences as juveniles, um, they're being systematically resentenced <coughs> across Pennsylvania. And there are about 300 people coming home to Philadelphia specifically. and um, But they've really formed a network among themselves. And some of those guys come to our groups, but then even the ones who don't, we, we do stuff together a lot. And I think that has just been amazing for them because it seems like just be, getting the chance to be around people who know what it was like where they were, who also know what coming home is like. Um, those guys are really tight with each other, and that seems to have been like a huge thing. You know, they're tight, and Richard is tight with them, and yeah, they have a lot. But it's so it's actually so fun for like me and for others to kind of get to see them get together because they just it's like a high school reunion or something. You know, they just love being together and love you know finding all the connections, and that seems to really be a huge point of support. So yeah. And you also could tell them about the center. Come on through, you know what I mean? Because we got a good support base. Yeah. yeah. It seems like a good note to end on, yeah. positive and encouragement. And I'd like to have you all join me in thanking our. compelling and motivating talk, I hope. Um, I know many of you are working in this area already. So, yeah. Ms. Moran, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.